on air. So good morning, Tom. Good morning, Tom. It's been a pleasure knowing you and uh, it's great having you here. Um, I'm Jim Gandal out of New York City and we know each other for quite some time and especially through various virtual communities. I'm happy to have you here. Uh, could you please um, just give a few sentences about yourself, just introduce yourself um, and we will kick off with our subject. Sure. Well, first, thank you, Jane, for inviting me to speak. And uh, it's a pleasure to be visiting with you today about an important subject, and we'll get into that. Um, I, uh, I, I really started in, in uh, product development, oh, back in the early 2000s. I, I actually transitioned from the business side of our company at the time over to the product development side. So I brought a business knowledge with me. And um, I was either promoted or sentenced, depending on how you look at it, to being a project manager at this company in the IT department. And um, I quickly realized how uh, insane uh, traditional project management practices were around the development of technical products. So I ventured off into the world of Scrum, mainly by accident, and uh, reading a an article by Ken Schwaber back in the old software testing and quality assurance magazine in, in uh, March of uh, 2003. And uh, I was intrigued by this. Um, at the bottom, uh, it said, if you want more information about this, please contact Ken Schwaber at his email address. And so I sent him an, an email. And um, and to my surprise, he responded immediately, I, I guess because I was working in a Fortune 50 company and he was intrigued by my fascination with it and, and my suggestion that I'd like to use Scrum in that company. So that formed a, a very long lasting relationship, uh, a mentoring relationship actually with him. That extended uh, you know, for almost seven years. Um, during that time, I, I expanded my contacts in the community. I actually worked as a scrum master from 2004 up till I retired from that company in 2013. Um, then I went out on my own. Uh, Schwaber helped me become a certified scrum trainer in 2008. When I say helped me, he mentored me and um, sort of molded me uh, into a certified scrum trainer. And uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. I've, I've moved into consulting and coaching of companies, but by far my main emphasis has been on, uh, on training certified Scrum product owner and certified Scrum master workshops. And I've trained over 450 of them, over 6,300 people have attended. So I've, you know, I've had quite a bit of experience in, in that realm. Well, that's really good to know. Thanks for sharing. It sounds like your 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 the deep roots are in in the, you know go back back in the days, and uh, you had some very good influence from the from the source, right? So Ken is clearly one of the sources, right? <laughs> yeah, he's clearly one of the greatest sources out there. And then uh, Tom, from what I remember, from what I, from what I see frequently, you you know you speak up, you 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 speak your mind, and you have some um, first first hand knowledge about things that. Uh, not too many people these days um, have uh, the privilege of knowing just because maybe they stepped into, the, into this industry uh, with the word agile, <laughs> concatenated with it, right? Too late or not early enough. So that's great. And, and he also, you know, you're pretty direct. And that's what really um, appeals to me because um, I'm also direct. Um, so why did I want to have you um, you know, join and maybe, you know, be, you know, I, 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 let's call it a conversation or more than an interview, right? Um, as an organizational design consultant and coach and also trainer, I, I go from companies, to, uh, from one company to company. And I have made over years many observations about trends, traits, uh, norms, values, behaviors, um, and also having done uh, a ton of work in the um, open space, I call it um, um, open source space, um, agile communities, globally and locally. I also have collected a lot of um, 
sentiments and uh, very from different people. Uh, I would call it factual evidence of, about sentiments and feelings and emotions people have about certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, so sounds like a you know a bunch of words, right? So uh, more specifically, I would like to have a discussion with you about uh, what many companies um, are facing today is the need to scale or you know, a, a simpler word perhaps could be an amplified goodness of agility at its basic rudimentary level. And in my experience, uh, not too many companies understand that to scale and, and operate at scale, they need to have goodness uh, to begin with in the first place. And many companies end up amplifying and just upscaling uh, dysfunctions and, and uh, uh, impediments at very at a very rudimentary level. So um, the net news is this: there are many frameworks out there. Uh, some of them are very well known commercially, right? You know, publicly known. I specifically would like to focus on something that I think has generated the uh, ha has acquired the biggest market share, has been most widely known and used, um, and uh, something that probably has a very, um, you know, very deep root. So specifically, I'm referring to SAFE, Scale Agile Framework, with a small E standing, I think, for enterprise or just to rhyme. I'm not sure what they, why they put the E there. So SAFE um, seems to be the most prevalent, the most commonly used known um, framework by many organizations. And there are tens and tens of thousands of people with certifications. And um, so many, there's so much buzz out there about SAFE. So I'm going to pause now. Um, first question I'm going to ask you, do you have any firsthand experience? And I, I think I know the answer would be yes, but just for the record, do you have any personal hand, uh, firsthand experience and, 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 and views on SAFE? Um, I've never actually worked with, the, with SAFE. Um, so I, I've never been involved in any product development with SAFE. So my views are built on academic studies and anecdotal evidence, mainly that I've heard from people who have used it. And so that's a disclaimer up front. I, Very good. You know, okay. I, I, and I'm not certified in any of their uh, areas. Was there a second part to the question? No, no, that was good. So that's a very good disclaimer. Just like you, I haven't been explicitly involved <clears throat> in safe uh, adoptions or, or installations or um, transformations, as they, they might, might be called. I have been about and around uh, many companies that have been entertaining the same. So, of course, I have my own uh, views and observations and sentiments, but. Um, this is also a great way to validate my own observations and, and my own personal perception uh, by uh, leveraging yours. So uh, my also my discom so very intimate knowledge, uh, seeing what's going on with the companies, but being firsthand embedded in the action, no, just like you, the answer is no. Um, so let me ask you this question. Do you have any views? Do you know, so because you have so much history and uh, um, you know, you know, some, some, some academic evidence uh, uh, at your disposal. Uh, what are the roots of SAFE? Uh, what, what's the origin of it? Uh, do, do you know how it came about? Well, so Leffingwell, actually, Dean Leffingwell, who um, started SAFE with Canaster. Um, and uh, I'm uh, trying to recall I think it's Richard Canaster, and I think it's pronounced Canaster. It's Polish, and that's how it's pronounced in Poland. But um, I don't know if he's changed the pronunciation here in the United States. But that's how it's, and I've never heard the name pronounced by him or on his behalf, so I don't know. But um, back in 2007, Leffingwell, I, and I have the book, wrote a you know a a good book called Scaling Software Agility, and um, I, I, I was fairly new to um, iterative incremental empirical product development. And there was some other books written about scaling early on. 
um, that I had looked at. And, you know, this was a, a pretty profound book. I mean, it was fairly large. It was well analyzed by him. Um, Leffingwell has a, a pretty strong background. In fact, I'd say he has a strong background in product development. It's more traditionally based. Um, but he and his experiences uh, drew, uh, it, it came out of um, a more defined process, the, what we generally term the unified processes. Um, the, the, probably the best known one is rational, uh, the rational unified process or RUP. Uh, that was developed by a couple of uh, former IBM guys. It was actually developed inside of IBM. And then um, I, I don't know the history of how they took it outside of IBM, but it was actually then taken outside of IBM. And before I was even involved in product development in the IT industry, I lived in Seattle and RUP was based in the Seattle, if I recall correctly. So there was a bunch of buzz around it because I had, in the late 90s, I had friends that were in the IT industry and they were talking about this completely different model from what we had generally termed the waterfall model. I, I call it the defined model. And it was, it was it premised on um, you know, a defined process, pretty elaborate one, but it was cyclical. So it was uh, one of the early attempts to look at um, cyclical feedback-based development, uh, you know, like Scrum is going back through the process in a in a work cycle over and over and over again to um, ostensibly uh, improve the product as you're building it based on feedback loops and that sort of thing. So uh, and it wasn't until 2011 that Leffingwell and Canaster, if I if I'm correct in my recollection, actually formalized their thoughts and Leffingwell's thoughts into this framework called SAFE. And, you know, it, it should actually be called SAF. I actually have a friend who likes to call it SAF, but in a uh, moment of marketing brilliance, they put the E on the end and made it a word that everyone could associate positively with. I mean, how can you go wrong with something called safe? You know, it's, it makes you feel safe. It's safe to use. We could use the word in so many different positive ways that um, it's just, uh, you know, it was just a moment of marketing <laughs> brilliance, really. And when, when you look at at the framework itself in these very elaborate posters and diagrams they have, it is a reincarnation of a unified process. I mean, it's, a, it's an updated version of a unified process. Very elaborate, um, has very many roles like Rupp did. Um, it's a, I would dare say it's a spinoff of it. Uh, but the name Rupp, I don't think ever appealed to anybody broadly didn't have any significance to anybody, but safe as a word appeals to people. I, actually, I'm thinking about this now. You said rub did not appeal. Yeah, it sounds like a little roughish, right? And safe sounds make much more safe-ish. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. this is really not about my um, you know, perception of, of the language uh, or syntax. Uh, so thank you for this, uh, Tom. So you mentioned something about the brilliancy and the elegancy of marketing. So this is something that has been always on my mind. And I talk to, I mean, I, I, I also have been analyzing success, clearly a, a humongous, uh, an amazing market penetration. Success is just immense. So um, do you feel <clears throat> that there is, so the, the greatness of it, of course, is that safe, very swiftly aligns with, uh, pretty much any agile tool that's out there. They, well, agile is in the tool, right? You know, um, it's a, used to be a project management tool. Now it has the word agile um, added to its name. So do, do you feel that this is also part of this um, marketing brilliance? And also I see majority of large consultancies as their you know, consultants walk into large firms with very thick PowerPoint decks, it is either safe or uh, their own permutation of safe with a little flavor and their own personal logo. Um, 
do, do you do, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, so one of the things that Leffing, Well and Canaster did was they marked the name safe, trademarked it. And uh, that was not done with Scrum. Scrum was kept in the, uh, in the public domain without any restrictions. Um, but, uh, and, and I should say the only restrictions around Scrum come from private entities like the Scrum Alliance or scrum.org and they have their own trademarks around certification marks they provide. But the framework itself was never restricted in use. Um, there was no licensing done with it and um, that, that's not true and safe. So there, you know, on one perspective, you could say that's brilliance. On another one, you could say it's selfishness. I, I'm not here to judge which one it is. I'm just here to say when they restricted that use, they maintained a dominance over a domain um, that would benefit them monetarily. And, I, you know, that's not to say that um, extreme programming or Scrum or other things have not benefited the creators monetarily. I, I think they probably have. But my point is that they, by restricting its use through um, permission or licensure, they uh, basically held on to control of the framework. And on their other side of brilliance. So that was one thing they did. The other thing was to align or to, to um, I'm going to say, uh, merge with Rally. So Rally embraced them fairly early on. Rally was a predominant project management tool in uh, what we would call the agile development space. Um, that marriage of those two entities resulted in significant bolstering of SAFE's presence. Um, the other thing that SAFE did is they immediately jumped on making it, and, and this is a personal opinion, making it so complex that they had to offer training and certification in it because it, it's a rather elaborate, it is an elaborate uh, framework and it, it's difficult to understand just on the surface of looking at it. There's many different roles in it. Um, the responsibilities of those various roles can be nebulous to you know, a neophyte or, uh, an, or the uneducated. Um, so they built in another money-making mechanism in that you know, they could license out these uh, certifications through trainers and you had to train their materials. That's my understanding. Um, and uh, again, that was another revenue stream for them. So I, you know, I don't want to downplay what people would argue is their contribution intellectually uh, to the industry, but I will not downplay at all their what I think is their underlying intention, and that is to make a, a lot of money here. And they've made a lot of money. There's no doubt about it. They've made a lot of money. And so uh, not just the creators of it, but people that have trained it or coached it, um, you know, and they they have control over that. If you're a, a consultant, a safe consultant, you, you know, you basically have to get certified and licensed to do that. And I think they keep pretty close tabs on who's out there, you know, proclaiming that they're a safe consultant. I think they call it an SPC, safe program consultant. So I, I you know, I don't condemn them for doing what they did. Um, I have to say I admire them because, you know, if their intention was to create something that filled a void in the industry, that is a scaling process and, they designed it and marketed it and controlled it in such a way that it made a lot of money for them. Well, I, I suppose that's the capitalist way. If there's money on the table, you gotta be silly not to take it, right? 
Uh, nobody's going to leave it on the table. And they certainly weren't going to do that. And frankly, so here's my criticism across the board of everything else outside of SAFE. SAFE recognized the need and they fulfilled it. And supply demand. Is it a su supply demand, right? Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, the <clears throat> void was as was the big elephant in the room. Uh, you know, I, I think broadly things like XP and Scrum were well received. You know, they had their critics as well, but generally it was better than working the other way. But then when these large companies started looking around and going, you know, how do we build these mega projects using this? There's, there's no way to really manage the work at a, at a scaled level at a, you know, at an increased size and voila, here came safe filling that void. And it was welcomed with open arms. So, so, so Tom, help me out here. So what, what really blows my mind is this. So I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a finance guy. Um, although my almost my entire career is spent in fintech, right? So you would think I've picked up a few nuggets. Sure. So, but I would like to think about this of, as as a capitalist, as the venture capitalist, as the sole proprietor, <clears throat> as a stockholder of a company that does it. So the, the, the a client company I'm referring to is 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 a client company. So speaking of economics of this. Um, every time, so you mentioned, so of course, you know, SAFE uh, is a great revenue generator uh, for whoever um, is behind it. I get that. But aren't large organizations, large enterprises smart enough to understand this? I mean, they have economists and uh, sociologists and, and accountants working for them. Uh, I mean, I, every company I go to, um, where SAFE is the uh, framework of choice, I see lots of superficial, uh, I'll call it peppering with, you know, assaulting and peppering with very superficial, uh, not, not long lasting, not impactful changes or creating an illusion of change. So companies should be smart enough. Senior management should be clever enough to see that there was very low penetration. There was very superficial um, you know, the very superficial results that are brought to the table, yet it probably costs a lot of money. So I'm trying to understand the dynamics. People should be smarter than that. I mean, why is this happening? Why do you think this is happening? Too much money yeah. on the table? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, so I'm going to approach your criticism, Gene, from this. Uh, I'm going to take the devil's advocate position, if that's okay. Sure. All right. So Number one, um, we, um, we like to spend lots of money as big companies on lots of things. So I don't think that the money spent on SAFE is of any great significance to a company broadly, right? And, and it's money that would be spent probably in, in other consultant uh, areas. Right. So if I didn't bring safe in and I still had to scale, maybe I bring in large scale scrum or maybe I bring in scrum at scale. The, the problem with doing that is the, the number of people available to to teach and coach that are limited. I mean, I can go out and find a safe consultant at the drop of a hat. And the framework is elaborate. It's it's put out there. I mean, I get a, you know, as part of, be, of getting safe consultancy, I, I get, you know, 10 complimentary life-size posters of the framework that I can distribute around my business. You know, I, so again, it goes back to the marketing brilliance of these guys. These guys were focused solely on scaling. They weren't focused on teams or anything like that. I mean, they, they even admit that we, that they, they claim to use Scrum at the core, at the team level of don't safe. Be, don't beat me to the punch there. That's a separate question. So right. Uh, so so <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, you know, so I'll bring in somebody and it, is it going to cost me? Yeah, it's going to cost me. The, the problem when, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll go to the other side of the coin now. Are we going to see actual change here? And 
I don't want to claim that executives are short-sighted, but what executives tend to want to see is dynamic change in productivity immediately. I mean, they want to see an ROI on this thing, like we're getting 25% faster production. Um, we're, we're going to Sutherland's, you know, twice the work and half the time mantra. <laughs> and so, so let's, let's examine and see, are we delivering product faster? Is it better quality? And a third dynamic at play, and I think this is important and probably underrated by people, is it allows us to keep a lot of the bureaucratic processes in place that we already had in place. So we don't have to change our organizational structure we don't really have, we just rename or rebrand thing, people. It's safe heaven. So it, it's, it's, it's a relabeling saga. Basically, you take the old, take, you know, lump it with Agile and you pretty much hit the... And, yeah, you know what's at play here? And I go back to them. I've gone back to them for many years over and over and over. It's Craig Larman's laws of organizational behavior. They're right at play here. And Larman was extraordinarily brilliant because he was predictive about how large, especially large organizational cultures would look at this. They're not interested in changing their structure and we're gonna conform whatever you bring in to what we do. We're not interested in throwing out our structure, changing our organization. We're not really interested in that. That's very disruptive and it's highly risky. So why would we do that? So let's bring, let's, and I call this magic. Let's bring in the magic. We'll suddenly do things faster, better, um, and we'll do it without dynamic, dramatic, drastic change in the organization, which is threatening to a lot of people. It has political consequences and most dynamic change like that does not survive the transition of executives through executive levels. If, I, if I'm a vice president and I come in and I go, by God, we're going to be agile. And then, you know, eight months later, I'm moved on to something else, to another job, another company, whatever. Then that transition doesn't bode well for keeping the momentum up of the change I was envisioning. It was my change, not the organization's change. So when he oh. leaves, they look and go, yep, you know, Tom's gone. So let's move on to the next thing. So a couple of things. First, I, I, I'll i be frank. I have my own aha moment. And I'm like, I give, give a disclaimer. I'm not an economist or a finance person, but uh, it has been always on my mind, the, the ethics and morale of of economics of this and so you kind of gave me a bit of a an, an eye opener there so if it wasn't safe it would be something else that these large organizations would be still spending their money it's only so this this is already budgeted for so some spend, cost yeah. so some cost it's a sunk cost right mm -hmm. um so and the, i think you this part i'm very clear on so the the volume of low quality um I would call them low quality for the most part because they're very superficial, educated, safe uh, consultants and safe uh, certification holders. The volume is just immense. It is so much easier to just go out and buy them on a, as a bunch. And bring yeah, and I, I, I just want to caution Gene about stereotyping people that way. I, I don't know intellectually or cap or capability wise, what you know how how they perform these consultants. I, I've never seen one in action. I, I do know that there's academic studies out there and there's anecdotal information that um, there have been successful safe uses out in the industry. Could so, you yeah. know, I think, I think we have to be fair to people. We've heard of, you know, tumultuous outcomes and, you know, supposedly we're safe. I know one company where safe was kicked out, you know, it's like, Put out on its butt. Well, so yeah, so I, I admitted there was a, an aha moment for me, but I'm also going to say this. So I agree with you. We need to be very careful and fair to people. But for example, my my experience comes from seeing many 
safe consultants, essentially just looking for ways to map the existing organizational structure to the framework, to the tooling configurations as they come out of the box. And to me, it's, of course, it's the lack of, um, you know, I, and I don't want to stereotype, but at the same time, there is a bit of a trend, maybe because of the sheer volume of people that do this that I've seen, but you are right. And, and I actually, I've heard firsthand uh, from some folks that there are actually um, pretty, you know, pretty successful less implementations, but they are supported by those very, very few people that really have, uh, you know, the, the, the original, the authentic knowledge of SAFE. So maybe not, not everyone should be put under the same umbrella. And let me just say this, that you know, you, you said they map safe to the existing structure and things like that. Mm. And I know from consulting in companies that when I meet with executives, they say, we're not interested in changing our structure. We want this thing mapped to our existing structure. And if you can't do that, well, by God, we'll find somebody that can. I mean, it, it comes that apparent to people but, it's but like, that comes from client companies them being them addressing the large consultancies make sure you whatever you implement for us make sure it maps to the existing organizational structure then right i mean it, it might not be that explicit but there's certainly an implicit understanding that we're not really interested in dramatically changing here that would be risky um, it could threaten us, uh, it could threaten our existence. Um, we're not, and you have to remember that I, I would venture a guess that most of the companies that bring SAFE in are not under duress. They're not in imminent danger of failing, of going under. I mean, they're not bringing SAFE in to rescue them. They're bringing SAFE in to say, under the guise of continuous improvement um, or, uh, you know, process improvement or however you want to characterize it, we're going to look at this as being a reasonably logical and rational way to do things. And it's not in the vein that we've heard these other things are like scrum or less. I mean, let Let's be candid, Gene, and let's be honest. Most people that, are, that have proposed the use of Scrum, and I'm one of them, and things like less or Scrum at scale have come in with the, basically the premise, if not the demand, that the organization has to radically change. I mean, I came into my company back in the 2000s saying, you know, for this to work effectively, we've got to change the structure here. We can no longer remain a matrix organization because you want dedicated teams to do this work, you know? And so you have to change um, not only your culture, but you've got to change as Larman has long advocated, you have to change how you actually do things here. Yeah. You know, and that's disruptive and threatening to people. I mean, especially if those people, you know, look out their window and they go, you know what, we're, we're not in a calamity here. We're not, um, as a friend of mine who was coaching at, at my old company said, I said, you know, Lowell, when do you think um, we're, this company will actually become agile? And he looked at me and he goes, when you're no longer the big dog on the porch, Tom, and that was a mantra that we used to use in my company. We were the big dog on the porch, you know, the dominant player. He goes, when you're under actual threat, then maybe you'll actually have to institute some fairly radical change. But until then, there's nothing that's motivating you to change. In fact, change is seen as something you don't really want to do. So Tom, this is, uh, of course, this, you know, jives really well with the, I think you probably know the, 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 the passage from uh, John Carter's, right? So you, in order for someone to be willing to change, they have to have the state of urgency. So if there, right. is no there is no state, I think it's John Carter, if I'm not mis if I'm mistaken. It's right up Carter's alley, yep. It's, yeah, you know, resistance to change, I use his video almost, you know, 
once a week at least uh, in, in my work. Uh, but specifically on, on, on those, uh, on, specifically on the subject of if there is no state of urgency, if there is no, if, there, if, if, if you're comfortably complacent uh, in your current existence, that your willingness to change and you may make to make any significant changes, any radical changes is, is pretty low. I mean, why would you rock your own boat? Why would you misplace yourself or create um, a risky situation for yourself and this super thick middle layer that you have internal organization? You probably will uh, play uh, risk avoidance. And uh, obviously, it, you know, to play safe, you need to uh, consider something like safe. Uh, but at the same time, what I'm so th this is not obviously um, we're not going to be rediscovering, uh, re reinventing the wheel for many people. I think people understand this, that unless we are going to change something radically, systemically, fundamentally, we're not going to look at those, uh, you know, more lean, more uh, native, more natural um, ways of um, agile, uh, ways of working, agile product development like Scrum, Kanban, Scrum at scale, large scale Scrum, those are obviously much leaner and much uh, you know, much more original, I would call. But at the same time, in SAFE, uh, if you open up this huge phenomenal uh, graphic, the, the, the picture, it's got Scrum, it's got, it's got Kanban, it's got pretty much every word uh, from the agile dictionary you can think of. So I oftentimes come across people and surprisingly, and I know I, I, I wanna be very um, objective here, but most of them are SAFE consultants. And they are very adamantly defending, the, oh, the very adamantly defend the fact that, look, we have it under control. We have it in there. So we are doing Scrum. We are doing Kanban. And uh, God knows if you mentioned- And we're that, lean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're lean, right? So what do you mean we're more aligned with PMI? No, we're not. We are much more adaptive, more agile. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I mean, am I too far off base even asking these questions? Um, no, no, not at all. In fact, the defense, that kind of posture and defense makes me very suspicious about it. Because I would be the first to stand up and go, is Scrum adequate? It can be, but there's, there's lots of problems with it. And as an organization, we need to identify and address those problems, organizationally speaking. SAFE, I think, and, and I guess I will stereotype here, I, I think SAFE comes in and says, this is an ideal model. You really don't have to change it. And Leffingwell has been quoted as saying, that was never our intention. Our intention was to give you a very elaborate framework, and then you can pick and choose what you want to use out of the framework. But my understanding, again, anecdotally speaking, is that consultants who come in don't advise that because they see that any kind of departure from the structure of the framework puts it at risk for being effective. And, um, and, and it leads, I think it leads them down what they feel is a dangerous path that, you know, you're gonna adulterize this thing and then I'm going to get blamed for allowing you to do that. And I can't really defend, yeah, your inadequacy here or your lack of, of um, success has come from the fact that you, um, that you adopted, you know, less of it than what is typically you know, recommended. And so what happens is they get into this circular logic loop of, yeah, you can, you know, decide what you want to use out of it, but it might not be effective. So, and so, it, I can't, you know, I can't really justify that in the end because I gave you sort of permission, if you will, to, to use only portions of it. It's funny you say that. So, so the, what comes to mind also, it's called the sunk cost fallacy, right? So, uh, if it's in the box and you bought the whole box, if it's in the a la carte, I'm going to eat every single piece of that meal. I'm not going to pick and choose, right? So, and it must be also dangerous if you take something out, 
what if so? Obviously, that that's the problem. Also, you mentioned something that it, and it brought back some memories. A couple months, a uh, few months ago, I interviewed. I should shouldn't say interviewed. Um, uh, uh, Dave Snowden uh, was uh, at one of my public meetups, and he he presented on <clears throat> he presented on something that was pretty interesting in general to the audience. But he explicitly talked about uh, why large consultancies love um, adopting safe. Sure. Uh, he called he called it an industrial model. They, He's I mean, right. They, He's right. Yeah. They are not there for short win. They are not there to uh, deliver value quickly. They are dug in for good because they have the whole, uh, you know, the whole army of people to feed and the whole <laughs> they have a big organization to 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 sponsor. So if they dig in. Uh, they have to dig in for for months, maybe years, and safe is an amazing way to do so because uh, it's almost like you unpack and install. There's so many roles and so many things that you need to support, and for so many more months. <laughs> yeah, I've recently heard it described as the other pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> That's a good way to frame it. <laughs> So, so Tom, uh, you know, one, I know we, 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 we think it's a great conversation and I, and so, so great. I mean, I'm, I'm realizing more and more than the less scripted something is. I have no idea what's coming from you. I have no idea what's coming from me. The more, the less scripted it is, the more, uh, the more authentic it is, the more interesting this becomes. Right. I think so. Right. Let, let me answer this question. <laughs> um, so the, or the, the, the co-creators, the founders of SAFE, uh, it sounds like based on years going back, you know, 10, 15, 20, almost uh, close to, to, you know, two decades, have they been around and about? Maybe not directly because I probably would know, not firsthand, but secondhand. Have they been around and about the Agile Manifesto co-signers? Co uh, what kind of dynamic was there maybe back? So I'm thinking of around the same time when these things have been, um, introduced to the industry. What kind of perception um, do you think exists today? We, we, you know, when I say Agile Manifesto co-signer, there's 17 folks that were in Utah, Snowbird, Utah, and maybe a small handful that were invited but couldn't make it. And I know some of those folks. But were safe guys also a part of this conversation, a part of this saga? You know, uh, I can't talk with any considerable knowledge about this. I have talked to a couple of the people that signed mm -hmm. it uh, about unified process people and whether there was contemplation like having Barry Bame there or any other UP guys. Kurt Schur, I think, is the guy who invented RUP. Um, I might have mispronounced his name, but, you know, largely the people that gathered there were already loosely affiliated with each other. They had already shared dynamics mm. um, around it. Um, like, uh, you know, I, and I, again, I don't know if, if some of them may have been invited. You might know this better than I do and then declined or couldn't make it uh, like Scott Ambler. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know uh, a person, I think, was um, sorely missed there was Craig Larman. I mean, Larman had already written a, a book about the dynamics of doing work, you know, and what we would call an agile approach long before the manifesto was written. I mean, along the lines of when, um, you know, books about extreme programming were written and that sort of thing. So I think, you know, I, I think there were people missing from that group. I do, I did hear the story of one person who said, I don't want to go to Utah in the winter. I have no interest in that. And then later expressed the most amount of remorse. He goes, have you ever done anything professionally or miss some, doing something professionally in your life? And you look back on it and you go, if there was anything I could change, it would be that one thing. And he goes, that's how I feel about declining an invitation to Utah that February. Yeah. You know, and I go, yeah, I get it. You know, we, we miss out on opportunities like that, not understanding at the time the gravity of the decision. But I yep. think, um, you know, one person told me the, the unified process guys were largely ignored and they effectively went underground after the manifesto came out. 
they really now with the exception of ambler ambler but ambler didn't really write a lot about unified process he wrote about you know agile approach to database building and things like that but it wasn't until later uh you know that that he started looking at disciplined agile delivery and that sort of thing the the common thread amongst all these people that were excluded was they worked for IBM. Mm. I, I find that fascinating. You know, in fact, discipline agile delivery got went back into IBM. Ambler actually became, you know, a scientist there at IBM. I think that's what they called him. And then eventually PMI bought the licensing rights, as I understand it, to discipline agile delivery or DAD. And that's now their, you know, uh, preferred scaling framework. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's interesting that the commonality, a common thread amongst all this is IBM, who, you know, at one time was the largest technology company in the world, you know, close, close to Hewlett Packard or Hewlett Packard was close to them in size. Yep. Uh, so uh, speaking of, so the, 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 the co-founders and the, 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 I call them tier one guys, uh, you know, there, there's quite a bit of, writing out there from them about safe yeah and then you you know you most of it from icon from ken schwaber from jeff sutherland and just to name a few of those though there's the name the list is actually much longer so it sounds like there have been some sentiments built up over years um but if you asked any of those people do you ever regret not actually i identifying this scaling issue earlier and addressing it, knowing that that was going to be the big elephant in the room eventually, they'd have to say yes. I mean, they'd have to, you yes. know, be, yes. because it's a large, again, it, it, it's a large void. You know, the, the whole idea of these things was to give teams power and things like that, but that's fine. I'm, I'm all for that. And I advocated that in the 2000s when I was using it. But there was no, there was no identification of portfolio issues, and they didn't really anticipate the advancement of technology into becoming, you know, really portfolios of work. They saw it, I think, even back in the 2000s, as segregated portions of work. Like these are applications that support business, and when. Um, you know, the CEO of Progressive Insurance came out in 2008 and said, oh, by the way, we're a software company that happens to sell insurance. That sent profound reverberations through the industries. I mean, this is a sudden admission that no longer is information technology supporting of a business. It is the business. And if it is the business, how do we manage the largeness of this? How do we manage the significance of what's now not only the big elephant in the room, it's the big elephant everywhere. You know, and some of that management went into from hardware into the cloud, I'll, I'll put it that way. Right. And, and so that gave us better, better management of data virtually than we had before. But work, you know, it, we didn't really have any vision of how we were going to manage work in the large. How was this going to happen? And, and to Leffingwell, Leffingwell's credit, he saw that. I mean, he, he came around in 2011 and go, this is, this is a big elephant in the room. So here's what you can do. And what happened after that? Oh, yeah. Out comes Blast. Out comes Scrum at Scale. Out comes Nexus. So. You know, I think I think this is the the writing is on the wall. I mean, he you know obviously Mr. Laffingwell is an amazing businessman, an amazing visionary, right? I mean, mm -hmm. not to be able to see something like this, of course, was the big, uh, you know, it, it was it was a shortcoming of those um, others, the seventeen, right? The the, the 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 Brady bunch of seventeen uh, manifesto co co signers. Have they seen this coming? They would have done something about this. Well, and in defense of them, some of them didn't care about methodologies. A lot of them cared about the culture of work, the, 
this sort of enigma of, um, you know, blaming software developers for all the problems that came along and, and asking them to go on death marches. I mean, I would have liked to have seen Ed Yurden signing the manifesto. I would have loved to have seen Fred Brooks sign the manifesto. These were people, um, Tom DeMarco, uh, Greg Lister, or, uh, Lister, you know, these guys were guys that way long before had condemned the way that we approached work. You know, that it was insane, that it was asinine, that, you know, there were better ways to do work. And, and all of them had suggested improvements in the way to do work. Those improvements not only went to the organizational level, but they also went to the team level, right? What none of them could anticipate at the time they were writing things is that we would be going from green screen development to interactive um, web-based development, you know, things like that. And agree, for those that might be listening to us, the green screen you're referring to off at COBOL mainframe. Yeah, all those legacy languages that, you know, just, per, just basically managed raw data, presented it back to you. You know, I'll, I'll pass Cal for a train. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I used green screen computers. I mean, you know, it's, you know, you type something in, used. something came back and that was that. So if you go to some of the modern vehicle departments, <laughs> you mm -hmm. would be what you see. Right. Yeah. And that's back when we did, you know, batch development and batch processing and those kinds of, you know, I mean, it, so, you know, and the thing is that, and maybe we can conclude with this, Gene, but we, yep. we see things as evolving so fast and justifiably so. You know, we don't know what it's going to be like in five years. Their suggestion that in five years, code will largely not be written by humans. It'll be. I'm scared. I'm scared of that. I, I, you know, we are looking at going. Really, we're not going to actually type in code. No, you're gonna. You know, you're gonna have automation creating these kinds of applications because you're gonna have artificial intelligence built into machines that are that, that will be able to do that. And we're, you know, we, we like put our hand to our forehead and go, my God, that's unimaginable. But I just saw an article on LinkedIn yesterday that showed a 1963 prototype of a cell phone. And with the claim that uh, pocket phones, that's what they called them, pocket phones will be in everyday use by everyone in the world someday. And I'm sure in 1963, they looked at that and went, yeah, really? I don't think Nobody so. Nobody believed that back then. It was, it was, it was a mystery. It was a oh, right. fiction. And then one person responded, we had to go through the box cell phone. I don't, I actually had this where you took, carried a case around, right? Motorola built them and you, you, you had, it looked like a small briefcase and you actually pulled the phone out of it. And, on it. So, and the other ones that looked like, you know, a walkie talkie out of the military, great big. Remember the pagers? And the pagers, right? They'd go off in the middle of a movie and you'd get the dirty looks, you know, be, but you were on call because you were doing work that required that you be available, you know? Yeah. So Tom, so uh, this, this, it, it's been, it, this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I appreciate your time and, and the, uh, and the candor, you know, stance and the fact that you shared your, you know, your, your personal experience and knowledge and some of this goes back um, in, in you know years of history, so that that's actually very useful. Um, any last word of you know just a, we can just wrap it as 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 where we stand or well last thirty seconds of a recap for whoever is going to be watching this. Yeah, let me just say that I can be as obnoxious and and um, assertive sure. as anybody out there when writing things, you know, and I often take a stance that's um intentionally provocative but i want to say that i think rational people sit back especially people that are academically oriented st stand back and they look at things through the lens of, a, of hypotheses right let's let's test this 
And I think you have to do that even in things that you're that grate you, like things like safe. All right, let's look at it. And um, and when you asked me to do this. I actually pulled up lots of academic studies about SAFE. There are, it's really got a pretty good volume of work out there. And academics test hypotheses. They're not, they're not, they try to set their biases aside. And I think that's rational. I think that's the right way to approach things. And let's, you know, like Schwaber used to tell me, you just deliver the news, Tom. You don't decide whether the news is good or bad. Just deliver the news and rational, intelligent people will act on the news you deliver and decide, you know, what to do and what changes to make. Yep. And I think that's the case here as well. You know, I'm not here to condemn safe to oblivion. Safe will, safe will die its own death if that's what's going to happen. I mean, it won't be us out there claiming that it's, a, you know, a poor framework or, you know, inadequate or anything like that. The actual experience with SAFE will justify whether its existence continues or it dies, just like, you know, everything else we do. Yep. I think that's a very good way to frame it and, 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 and phrase it and, and wrap this. Uh, in the end, we really want to bet on smart, clever people and, and their decisions. If someone really sees safe being uh, in great alignment with their own system optimizing goals, and you know, it, it, if they see this really as a value delivery mechanism, not, not a fad, but a real you know, success, a real result, then God bless them. So be it. I mean, yeah. and you know, it goes back to the adage and it's kind of a pun here, but you got to make it safe to fail, you know? So if it fails, uh, is it safe? I don't know. But my point is that, you know, you're going, they're going to experience this. And if they're objective about it, they're going to decide these organizations, do we continue with this or not? And if not, then well, like you, like you said, companies have so much money to spend on things like this. So who's going to actually walk out and say, you know, I admit it was a wrong choice. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, we blew 50, you know, 85 million bucks on this large consultancy that installed safe for the last couple of years. But we now admit we did the wrong thing. We will not do it again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Gene, if I had a nickel for every time a large consultancy was brought into my company to tell us and provide a recipe how to fix things, I would be, be a millionaire. I'd be a millionaire. Of course I would. And, you know, nobody ever looked back and went, wow, you know, they really stole money from us. No, no you know, one would ever do that. They, they always looked back and went, I guess we didn't do what they really said we needed to do. That'll, that'll be their position, right? We told you to do this and you didn't do it. And so now we'll come back in and we'll try again. <laughs> we should have structured this whole conversation based on rhetorics and, 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 and sarcasm and, and lyrics and, 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 and anecdotes. <laughs> well, one thing about, uh, as my friend Mario tells me, he goes, one thing about growing old, or in your case, experience, Tom, is you can count on cynicism taking a more prevalent position in your life. <laughs> I, 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 I think I, I agree with this statement. All right, it's Tom. Been pleasure, well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. I'll zap it, wrap it, record it, uh, the recording that is, and um, I'll share with you, of course, and with some, you know, some other folks that might be interested. I think it was a very uh, informal educational piece that we put together. Hopefully people will find it useful. I hope so too. And I look forward to seeing you at the ne next uh, New York meetup. I always love Hopefully, going. To uh, yeah. I would like to see you there as well. I, you know, and I appreciate you. I, I see you coming from time to time. So I'd like you to be there again next time. Next I always time. promote it after my classes. I go, yeah, this oh, is a great meetup. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Please. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Stay safe. Take care. Thanks again, Gene. Cheers.